Jesus name and for those who are coming for the first time we're so happy you are here and we pray the Lord will enrich your life from the study tonight in Jesus name for the old timers leaders pastors workers members I pray the Lord will make us appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus more than ever before and you'll be a friend to Jesus let's pray together father we thank you for the Bible study we thank you for your people who are here we thank you for what you've done for us on the cross of Calvary and we're asking Lord that tonight you open our eyes once again to see what great things you've done what th great things you've suffered and what you provided through that suffering of yours for every one of us in Jesus name we pray your spirit will take the word and apply it to every heart tonight and all the provision of Calvary will be to all the children of God in Jesus mighty name we pray we're coming to study from John chapter 18 and for those who are coming for the first time we'll be studying the gospel according to St. John from chapter 1 now we're in chapter 18 and we're looking at the closing verses of that chapter tonight we're reading from verse 28 verse 28 of John chapter 18 it says then let the Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment and it was early that means early in the morning and they themselves went not into the judgment hall lest they should be defiled but that they might eat the Passover verse 29 Pilate then went out unto them and said what accusation bring ye against this man they answered and said unto him if he were not a male factor if he were not an offender if we were not somebody that merits judgment we would not have delivered him unto thee then said Pilate unto them let take ye him and judge him according to your law the Jews therefore said unto him it is not lawful for us to put any man to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which is speak saying unto them signifying what death he should die then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him and thou the king of the Jews Jesus answered him and said uh, seest thou this of thyself or did others tell thee tell it thee of me Pilate answered am I a Jew thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me what hast thou done Jesus said Jesus answered my kingdom is not of this world if my kingdom were of this world then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews but now is my kingdom not from hence Pilate therefore said unto him are thou a king then Jesus answered thou seest that I am a king to this age was I born and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice Pilate says unto him what is truth and when he had said this he went out again unto the Jews and says unto them I find in him no fault at all but he had a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews then cried they all again saying not this man but Barabbas now Barabbas was what a robber that's the passage we are looking at today and I've titled this uh, study tonight the unjust trial of the just one the unjust trial of the just one Jesus Christ is referred to as the just one the righteous one the holy one the very son of God 
And as you look at the comment of the rest of the New Testament, you'll find that in referring to what we're looking at today, the trial of Jesus, the judgment of Jesus, the betrayal has taken place already. He had been delivered to the hand of Pilate, and Pilate now wanted to know, what do I do with this man? And before he would know what to do with this man, with the Lord Jesus Christ, he had to make sure that he found out what had he done and what offense did he commit why does he merit this that the jewish people were recognizing were recommending unto him but you understand as we look at jesus christ his perfect life his spotless life his flawless life his blameless life is referred to as the just one the righteous one and the holy one we're looking at acts of the apostles chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 13 acts of the apostles chapter 3 we're reading from verse 13 it says the god of abraham and of isaac and of jacob the god of our fathers has glorified his son jesus whom ye delivered up is referring back to this time of trial you jewish people you delivered him up and denied him in the presence of pilate when he was determined to let him go look at verse 14 but she denied the holy one and the just that's the lord jesus christ the holy one and the just and de and de de desired a murderer to be granted unto you and you killed the prince of life whom god has raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses we come to chapter 7 of acts of the apostles and we're reading from verse 52 still talking about the identification mark of the lord jesus christ the personality of the lord jesus christ the holiness and the righteousness of the lord jesus christ is referred to as a just one in chapter 7 of acts verse 52 which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and they have slain them which should before of the coming of the just one those prophets prophesied about the coming of christ about the coming of the son of god about the coming of christ the just one of whom ye have now been the betrayers and the murderers so you see that jesus christ is referred to as the just one as we look at the trial today that is the trial of jesus before Pilate and before those uh, Jewish uh, leaders, you understand what he did was unjust. It was an unjust trial of the just one. Chapter 22 of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 22, reading from verse 14. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 22, reading from verse 14. And he said, The God of our fathers has chosen thee. This is Ananias, Ananias talking to Paul the Apostle at the time of his conversion and he said the god of our fathers has chosen you that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one you see the right in capitals is referring to jesus christ that you'll see him christ the savior christ the lord christ the righteous one the just one and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth and so you understand jesus christ he was just he was righteous he was pure and yet he died and yet he was betrayed and yet he was crucified and yet he was buried and yet he suffered all that he suffered the question is why will god allow such a just one such a righteous one and such a blameless one to go through all that kind of suffering we're told the reason why in first peter chapter 3 verse 18 first peter chapter 3 verse 18 this is why jesus came and this is why jesus suffered and this is why jesus uh, went through all the things they went through until he was crucified on the cross of calvary first peter chapter 3 reading from verse 18 for christ also as one suffered for sins the just for the unjust there we are he suffered for sins he had no sin of his own he suffered for your sin he suffered for my sin he suffered for the sins of the whole world and it says for christ also as once he suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to god 
were far away from God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there was no way we could come back to God because we had a penalty to pay. And we had some suffering to go through. We had the punishment of sin to bear. If we bore that punishment, that would be eternal damnation, eternal doom, eternal suffering. You know, once somebody gets to hell, he cannot say, I've suffered enough. I've paid for all things that I've done. And so Jesus Christ had to come. Behold this, the lamp of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so we're told here the reason why he suffered and the reason why he had days on just a judgment and on just a trial and the reason why the righteous, the holy, the pure, the perfect, why he had to go through everything he went through. For Christ also as one suffered for sins, for your sins. And then you don't have to suffer for those sins anymore. Because once you are forgiven because of Jesus Christ, then the sins are forgiven and forgotten and they are blotted out. And it says that the just for the unjust, you are the unjust person. You are that unjust sinner. And it says it's so that he might bring us to God, might bring you to God, being put to death in the flesh and quickened by the Spirit. Again, tonight we are looking at this passage under the title, under the subject, the unjust trial of the just one. There are three things we're looking at as we look at the passage in John chapter 18, reading from verse 28. It divides naturally to three parts. The first part, verses 28 to 32. The cruel misjudgment and wickedness in tradition. You find that the Jewish people are traditional traditional religion and yet in the midst of that traditional religion they were cruel and they judged the Lord Jesus Christ it was a misjudgment the misplaced righteousness the cruel misjudgment and the wickedness in tradition the wickedness of traditional people point number two Christ's mission and witness to the truth he said, this is why I came, for this purpose I came, for this reason I came. He talking to Pilate and he outlined once again why he came. He outlined once again the power of the truth. And he outlined once again the proclamation of the truth. And the reason why he was a witness to that truth. Point number two, Christ's mission and witness to the truth. Number three, the concealed mischief and willfulness of transgressors you see Pilate said i find nothing wrong in this man this is sinless this is a sinless man this is a pure man and this is a spotless man he's done nothing wrong there is no fault at all in him and the people still said all the same condemn him they were concealing something they were hiding something you know there was bitterness in their heart hatred in their heart and there was jealousy in their heart there was envy in their heart that's what they concealed and they had mischief with the heat from everybody else and they were willful in their transgression point number three the concealed mischief and willfulness of transgressors we're coming to number one tell me number one so i know you got it The cruel misjudgment and uh, wickedness of the traditionalists in tradition. We're coming to chapter 18, and I'm reading from verse 28 once again. It says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. You understand? They were going to try him now. They were going to ask him questions. They were going to interrogate and investigate. What have you done? And how can you defend yourself against all these allegations that are brought against you? And it says, and it was early. Look at this. They themselves went not into the judgment hall. Look at this. Lest they should be defiled. What does that mean? They were Jewish people. The chief priests, the high priests, Jewish people. And all these leaders accusing the Lord Jesus Christ, Jewish people. And they wouldn't even go to the hall of judgment because you see Pilate was a Gentile. He was a Roman governor over the people of Israel. He had been appointed by the Roman Empire so that this man would be a governor. And he counted the hall 
belonging to the Gentile unclean. And if they went there, they felt we well, will be unclean. And if we're unclean, we'll not be able to eat the Passover. That's why they said, but that they might eat the Passover. Can you think of that? People that have cruelty in their hearts, and yet they were obeying tradition. People that wanted to kill the Lord Jesus Christ unjustly, and yet they will not enter into a physical building because they didn't want to de defile themselves. If you look at Mark, you'll see that that's what their religion comprised of. All they wanted to do was just to observe a physical law, an outward thing. But their heart was defiled in the sight of the Lord. It tells us in Mark chapter 7, and I'm reading here from verse 9. Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 9. And he said unto them, full well, you reject the commandments of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. They had rejected the words of Jesus. They had rejected the words of being born again. They had rejected the word of righteousness. They had rejected the word of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They had rejected the offer of his forgiveness. They had rejected the truth that is that he brought because he said he shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free they rejected all that and yet they were following tradition we must eat the passover and if we're going to be qualified eating the passover we cannot go to the hall of the gentile because that will defile us look at verse 13 it says making void the word making the word of god of non effect through your tradition which ye have delivered and many such like things ye do that he said uh, these uh, jewish people they'll keep tradition and you find there are many people like that today they can go through the what they call the lunch and then they can fast for all those uh, 40 days and then after that the anger is still there the malice is still there the animosity is still there and the bad habits of old they are still there but they will keep the tradition other people may have any other tradition you dress a particular way it may be that they dress in a particular color because that is what their tradition their religion that's what is stipulates for them and yet the hatred is there the bitterness is there the violence is there other people may have other kind of traditions they keep uh, when they wake up in the morning and they sing and they read the bible when they're going to sleep at night they sing and they read the bible all the same the message of salvation is not respected and the message of salvation is not taken in they just follow tradition and yet they deny the word of the lord it tells us about uh, let's come back to john now chapter 18 after they have shown that they were traditional people religious people that didn't have a mind to keep the word of god it says in verse 29 of john chapter 18 Pilate then went out unto them and said what accusation bring ye against this man and uh, they should have answered directly is he did this he did this he did this and according to the law of god shows the chapter shows the verse this is what he has done and is guilty of this or that but look at their reply they replied in verse 30 they answered and said unto him if he were not a malefactor if he were not a transgressor if he were not somebody to be judged we would not have delivered him up unto thee just take our word he's a sinner just take our word you ought to be judged just take our word you ought to die if he were not a criminal if he were not an offender would we should we have brought him unto you well, don't ask us what he has done that's between us that's inside us leave that alone and crucify him and then look at verse 31 then Pilate said unto them take him and judge him according to your law if you are not ready to tell me what he has done if you are not ready to tell me what he is guilty of then take him and go and handle that by yourself then the jews the jews therefore uh, said unto him it is not lawful for us to put any man to death we want him to die 
but we don't have the right we don't have the authority we, we have condemned him he must die he must not live but we don't have any way we can do that ourselves so that that's the reason we are appealing to the roman law so that you must find something in the roman law and condemn him so that he will die then verse 32 says that the saying of jesus might be fulfilled which is speak signifying the death that he should die and let's come back to luke chapter 23 and see what all the gospel writers have said about this same occasion about this same thing that happened so that you understand jesus was the just one the righteous one and the holy one he did nothing that merited all the evil they heaped upon him luke chapter 23 I'm reading from verse 1. It says, The whole multitude they, they of them arose, and they led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation. That, that's not true. He did nothing. He said nothing to pervert the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. That's wrong. That's not true. Because Jesus said, give unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and uh, give unto God the things that belong unto God. Look at the blatant lie. Look at the open lie. And look at the clear lie they were telling about against the Lord Jesus Christ that was forbidding them to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. You know the implication of that? He, they said he was saying, pay your taxes to me, I'm the king, and come and give me the tribute, I am the king. Leave Caesar alone, don't do anything for Caesar. There was nothing like that at all, and yet they accused him that these were the things he said, and Pilate asked him saying art thou the king of the jews and he answered and said thou sayest it you see once again the calmness of christ and the courage of christ he wasn't intimidated all those people were there the soldiers were there and the jews were there and the mob was there they were shouting he must die he's a criminal he's a male factor he's an offender and all the same he remained cool and calm and courageous and I pray that he'll grant you that same courage in Jesus' name. So that when we're to live for righteousness without any compromise, we will stand for what is right and for what is true in Jesus' name. Look at verse 4. Then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. What have you said? He said, you can't prove it all the accusation and all the allegations you are making against him you cannot prove anything at all i find no fault in this man and they were the more fear saying he stirs up the people teaching throughout all jury beginning from galilee even to this place he teaches, he proclaims, he goes about preaching. What was he preaching? He was preaching about the love of God. What was he preaching? He was preaching about repentance. What was he preaching? He was preaching the word of the gospel of salvation. And he said, because he's preaching everywhere, he's turning up the people, he's turning up them all to repent and to become good citizens of the kingdom of God and good citizens of the kingdom of this world. But this is what they say. But look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 27 Matthew chapter 27 I'm reading here from verse 27 the scene over there the situation over there the circumstances over there that Jesus faced calmly and when Christ enters into you he imparts his own life unto you he imparts his own courage unto you and he imparts his own righteousness also unto you look at verse 27 of chapter 27 in matthew it says then the soldiers the, the soldiers of the governor took jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him tell me there the whole bunch of soldiers and they were not few at all a multitude of angry looking soldiers a band of uh, powerful people with all dressed and have, having their sword and having all their spears and jesus remained peaceful he remained poised 
he remained calm he remained cool and nothing could shake him i pray that in your own temptation in your own trial at the time of your own persecution the coolness of christ the calmness of christ and the courage of christ will be in your heart in jesus name you will not be intimidated and you will not cringe you'll not fall you'll not be a coward in jesus name do you remember the message we had yesterday that the things written concerning christ those were the things being fulfilled and jesus knew that he knew that the things that were written concerning him will be fulfilled he wasn't surprised all the accusation he wasn't surprised about this fake trial about this cruel misjudgment and about this unjust trial it didn't surprise him at all you know why look at psalm 35 psalm 35 reading from verse 16 in verse 35 reading from verse 16 it says with hypocritical mockers in feast you see they were going to take the passover that's their feast hypocritical mockers in feast they gnashed upon me with their teeth they knocked upon me with their teeth that he said they told all those lies he was looking at them and he remembered the scriptures and he said everything that had been written concerning me must be fulfilled and what they were simply doing was fulfilling what had been written concerning him anytime any problem comes to you any trial comes to you any situation in which you find yourself you understand that all things work together for good for them that are the cause who are called according to the purpose of God who love him and who fear God and everything will work for your good in Jesus name nothing will ever happen that the grace of God will not see you through because he's been reaching and since he's been reaching and you're going through that you will not shake you will not falter you will not cringe you will not fall you will not compromise in jesus name but let's look at the condition of these uh, pharisees and sadducees these traditional people and these uh, people that were giving this on just trial to the lord jesus christ we're coming to jeremiah chapter 7 jeremiah chapter 7 and look at it from verse 8 over here it says behold ye trust in lying words that cannot profit all these uh, Jewish people, all these religious traditionalists, they were trusting you know, in lying words that could not profit. Will you steal and murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom ye know not and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we're delivered to do all these abominations look at these people they wanted to keep the passover the passover was ordained of god was appointed of god it was an ordinance of god for the children of israel from the old testament times and yet look at them in the midst of their evil in the midst of murder in the midst of wanting to do this cruel thing and yet they were going to keep the passover and the lord is asking them will you come and stand before me in this house the house of worship in this house the temple of god in this house the place of prayer in this house the very gate of heaven and then uh, mention my name call upon my name and say we're delivered to do all these evil things all these abominations it just shows you the hypocrisy of those people it shows you the uh, mean sincerity of those people look at verse 11 is this house the house of god is this house the temple of god is this how the gate of heaven which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes behold even i have seen it says the lord he knew their hearts and he knows the hearts of all people today the people who pretend to be worshiping god and every sunday every sabbath day they go to the house of god and yet there's no change of life there's no repentance and the evil things go on they do it in the morning before going to the service after the service they continue their evil sin even during the service their hearts are not right in the sight of god they kept on doing those evil things and yet they keep on in their traditional religion i pray god will deliver you from that and let's look at what happened to them at the time of jesus in matthew chapter 23 
Matthew chapter 23. I'm reading here from verse 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. It says, Want to use scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. It says that this word here matters of the Lord justice, that's judgment and mercy and faith. These ought she to have done and not to have left the others undone. You see, these people, re traditional people, religious people, all they will say, we must keep the Passover. All they want to do, we must pay the tithe. And to the very minutest the, the kind of uh, a calculation, they want to pay the tithe and the offering. But then, uh, no righteousness, no justice, there's no fairness, but then there is no mercy and there's no love, and they never forgive uh, anyone. They must retaliate by all means. They went on in envy, they want, went on in jealousy, and there was no faith in God. All this you ought to have done. They should make the weightier matters of the word of God the number one, and then after that they could uh, pay their tithes or whatever. But look at verse 24, ye blind guides, a witch train at a knot. What that means is that if they were going to drink uh, any kind of uh, you know soft wine or whatever, all the, the foam on, on it, if there's anything that look like it not, that is like a, like a little insect, they would strain that away. But then a the whole camel, they will swallow. Look at that again. He said, the big things will not take care of. You can murder, you can kill. You can steal, you can do whatever, and then the little, little things, I must not wear that, I must not uh, cross that place, and I must uh, wash my feet when I get into a place, I must wash my hands, I must keep the tradition. Those little, little things, they kept, and the big things, and the great things, and the weightier things, they will not keep. Their hearts were not right. Their behavior was not right. Their character was not right. In the sight of the Lord, ye blind guys, verse 24, ye strain at a knot and swallow a camel. Won't you scribe some Pharisees, a hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup. That's what tradition does. Uh, those who are traditional in their worship, they can do the outward thing, the singing, they can do the outward thing, the reading, they can do the outward thing, the dressing, they can do the outward thing, the ceremonies, they can do the outward thing, they can go here and go there, they can climb the mountain, they can do the open external prayer, public prayer, but then in their heart, it says, for ye may clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Bribery and corruption is there. They are not born again. Stealing is there. They are not born again. Uh, examin examination cheating is there. They are not born again. Extortion, oppression of other people. They are not born again. They can even kill. They can destroy other people's lives and scatter other people's families. They are not born again, but they'll be a uh, keeping to tradition. Verse 26, that blind Pharisee cleanse force that which is within the cup and the platter that the outside of them may be clean also want to use scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye are like unto whited sepulchres which indeed appear beautiful outside if you attend the service of some of these for some of these people who follow tradition the service is well regulated the service is well organized everything is neat everything is well organized but the problem is a problem of the heart on the outside they appear beautiful they appear well organized they appear solemn and they appear religious but it says but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness even so he also outwardly appear righteous unto men if you were to judge them by outward law outward appearance outward comportment you'll say they have accepted they have uh, passed uh, the test but it says only outwardly do they appear righteous unto men but not unto god because within uh, you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity i pray that will not be our lord well that will not be my lord Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 25. 
Acts of the Apostles chapter 25. I'm reading from verse 16. 25 verse 16. It tells us to whom I answered, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him and see this is what the jewish people are guilty of they won't even give jesus christ a chance to answer for himself they just said we have accused him and we have told him we told you he ought to die why are you asking us what he has done if he were not an offender a criminal somebody who is a transgressor would we have delivered him into your hand it says over here in acts chapter 25 that even the Romans, the Gentiles will not do that. That the sinners will not do that. That the courts of the world will not do that. And there are people in the church who are called, uh, whatever they are called, and then they will judge people without even listening to them. And they already passed the verdict without listening to them. And they will not allow them the chance of speaking for themselves. And they will block the way from uh, the people who can listen to them. Unbelievers will not even do that when they understand fairness, when they understand justice, and when they understand fair play. Look at that verse 16 again, to whom I answered. It is not the manner of the Romans, even though they are Gentiles. It is not the manner of the Romans, even though they are, they are the world. It is not the manner of the Romans, even though they, do, they, are, they don't claim to be born again. It is not the ro manner of the Romans to deliver any man, any man of whatever tribe, any man of whatever persuasion, any man to die, any man to be judged, before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face that is we must allow them to come and defend themselves and we must not hide anything we must not uh, use a uh, diplomacy in the church of the living god we must not not allow the character and the behavior of the pharisees to take effect in the church we give everybody a fair chance and we give everybody the opportunity to answer for themselves so that face to face will meet with them and they have license to answer for themselves concerning the crime against them but really look at the real situation here we're coming to luke chapter 18 luke chapter 18 you see in the verse i read over there in john chapter 18 verse 32 it says that the saying of jesus may be fulfilled he said it he knew it was coming he knew it will happen and he said it before and the disciples can now verify that this is exactly what jesus said what did he say look at luke chapter 18 verse 32 luke chapter 18 verse 32 for he shall be delivered unto the gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on and they look at this verse, uh, verse 33 now and they shall scotch him and put him to death and the third day he shall rise again i said the third day he shall rise again he knew it was coming and it came just like that when you become a christian you've been told that if anyone will live a righteously or godly he will suffer persecution persecution will come and so since you know that persecution is coming when it comes she will be surprised i said she will be surprised he has saved you and chosen you out of the world and because of the war of that the world will hate you we knew that before and when you see the hatred of the people of the world she will be crying she will be surprised we know that it will come we are told that temptation will come but god will make a way of escape and when that temptation or trial comes we know that the way of escape is there you will overcome we're reading from Luke chapter 24 and I'm reading from verse 44. Luke chapter 24 verse 44. He had risen from the dead now. You see, whatever trial, it will come to an end. Whatever judgment, it will come to an end. Whatever pressure, persecution, opposition, one day it will come to an end. And whatever you are going through now, just a moment, everything will be over in Jesus' name. And eventually they crucified him. Eventually he died. And eventually rose from the dead you will rise again 
out of that obscurity out of that problem out of that pressure you're going to come out of it in jesus name and now after he came out look at what he said in luke chapter 24 verse 44 and he said unto them these are the words which i speak unto you while i was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled underline that in your bible all things must be fulfilled it doesn't come by surprise this one is not taking us in our ways all things must be fulfilled this is part of what had been written this had been known thousands of years before and i came to fulfill that that was written concerning me all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of moses and in the prophets and in the psalms concerning me then open he the understanding that they might understand the scriptures you will understand the scriptures we're coming now to chapter 18 of john john chapter 18 and we'll come to point number two john chapter 18 reading from verse 33 john chapter 18 verse 33 important words in the midst of the trial in the midst of the persecution in the midst of the lies of those uh, jewish people look at what happened now it tells us in john chapter 18 reading from verse 33 it says then pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called uh, jesus and said unto him are thou the king of the jews about the king of the Jews remember he was the governor of the people let's come to I'm coming back to that John chapter 18 but let's come to Matthew chapter 27 Matthew chapter 27 reading here from verse 11 Matthew chapter 27 reading from verse 11 so that you'll understand the position of Pilate so you'll understand who Pilate was asking a question the question was asking it says in uh, Matthew chapter 27 verse 11 and Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him saying art thou the king of the Jews who is the governor I said who was the governor here Pilate, the governor, Pilate, as James saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. Let's come back to John now so you understand who was asking the question, his position in the nation, his position politically. And now he was asking the Lord Jesus Christ about the kingdom and about the kingship and about his position and about his authority it tells us that we're reading from john now chapter 18 verse 33 then pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called jesus and said unto him and of the king of the jews think about the governor asking such a question and think about the highest person in the land politically asking such a question and think of what he might be feeling inside maybe you'll feel there's a competition here this man says that the king of the jews i am appointed to be the king and the governor and the ruler and the leader over the people let me ask him himself you see jesus christ will never tell a lie he is the way he is the truth and the life where whatever situation you find yourself don't think if i answered this way that will be their conclusion if i answer that way, when you're thinking like that you'll be thinking of telling a lie just tell the truth and the truth will take care of the situation in jesus name look at verse 34 and jesus answered him saying thou uh, 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 seest thou this of thyself or did others tell it thee of me look at jesus christ he was there uh, as uh, a prisoner he was there as an accused person he was there somebody wanted to judge and the governor asked him a question are you the king of the jews and he looked him straight in the face and said are you saying that by yourself or did somebody tell you that about me i pray god will give you courage 
You see, it is cowardice that makes us to compromise. It is cowardice that makes us to cringe. It is cowardice that makes us not to follow what we believe, not to follow our conviction. His conviction was that he was the Son of God, and he is the Son of God. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the King of the Jews, and he is the King of the whole universe. And so he stood there courageously and boldly, and he said, are you saying that of yourself? Or did somebody tell you that about me? Was that a fiver? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What said, What hast thou done? And Jesus answered, This is wonderful. My kingdom is not of this world. It says, we're not on the same plane. We're not on the same road. You are the king, physical, natural. You are the king, earthly. You are the king over here, the governor. And it is temporal, but mine is eternal. Mine is supernatural. Mine, it goes beyond this world. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? Did you find any of my disciples here wanting to fight you? Did you find any of my followers here wanting to displace you? Did you find any of my people here wanting to push you aside? Why are they not doing that? Because my kingdom is different from yours. We're not in competition at all. You are of this world, but I am of that world which is to come. It says uh, they would have thought that I should not be delivered unto the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Really now tell me, art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. If you ever told any truth in your life, that's the truth, I'm a king. You say it yourself, you affirm it yourself, you confirm it yourself, that's who I am. For to this end was I born, and to, for this purpose, for this cause, came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. What truth? The truth of my royalty, the truth of my dominion, the truth of my power, and the truth of my kingship. And I'm bearing witness, and everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. This truth that Jesus Christ is king, how do we know it is the truth? How do we affirm that? How do we confirm that? Come to Psalm 2. We're looking at the Psalms now. And we're looking at Psalm 2. Whoever is the Son of God, that's the King. Whoever is the one that will reign, that's the King. Look at Psalm 2. I'm reading here from verse 6. Psalm 2, reading from verse 6. And you will see here what the Almighty God Himself said. You will see that Jesus Christ only came to bear witness to what the Father, the Heavenly Father, the God of heaven, had said. Look at Psalm 2, verse 6. It says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Who is this king? Verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And that's why Jesus said, I came to bear witness to that. God said that. The Almighty God said that. My Heavenly Father said that. He calls me Son and He calls me King. And the Son of God is the King. And I come to bear witness to the truth. Look at verse 8. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. It says, uh, you know, I'm asking the Father, and He's going to give me all the heathen through salvation, through righteousness. He's going to give me the heathen for my inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for my possession, for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Jesus is King. I say, chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 6, Isaiah chapter 9, reading from verse 6, it says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, 
the government shall be upon his shoulder he said that's what i came to bear witness to i am the king thou says i am for this purpose i came and for this reason i came so that i will be a witness unto the truth and he says his name shall be called tell me somebody there wonderful counselor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace of the increase of his government he has a government his governor he has a government his king and he is the final authority and it says of the increase of his of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of david and upon his kingdom he has a kingdom to order each and to establish each with judgment that is justice and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the lord of hosts will perform this somebody said amen, amen. jeremiah jesus is king jeremiah chapter 23 jeremiah chapter 23 i was reading from verse 5 Art thou a king then of course yes thou seest it for this purpose came i into the world to bear witness unto that truth unto that fact that I am king. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 23, and we're reading from verse 5. Jeremiah 23, verse 5. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise up unto David a righteous branch, capital B there, and a king, capital K there, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Not only in Israel, not only in Jerusalem, not only in, in Rome, but all over the earth. And you see there, it's referred to as a king, and his kingdom was coming, and it's going to reign. Look at verse 6. In his days, Judah shall be saved. Salvation will come, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, the name of the king, the name of the king of kings and the lord of lords, whereby he shall be called the lord lord our righteousness who is that jesus christ zechariah chapter 9 zechariah chapter 9 this is the king a king then thou says for this cause came i into the world to be a witness unto this truth the truth that jesus christ is king i pray he'll be king over your life he'll be king over your family he'll be king over all your character and he'll rule over you in love and mercy and grace in Jesus name Zechariah chapter 9 I'm reading from verse 9 Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 rejoice greatly O daughter of Zion shout O daughter of Jerusalem behold thy king cometh unto thee Be behold thy king cometh unto thee tell me what follows is just is the just one is the just one even though they were giving him an unjust trial this king is the just one having salvation having salvation and as you come to him and you surrender to his lordship and you surrender to his uh, royalty he'll give you salvation is slowly riding upon an ass and upon the coach upon a coach the form of an ass we're coming to John chapter 1, John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 49. This is king, is our king. He is my king. Over my heart is king. Over my life is king. Over all my actions is king. I'll surrender to him completely and fully. I'll surrender to him completely, totally, without any reservation. I will obey him without interruption. We're coming to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 49. John chapter 1 verse, 40, verse 49. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art, tell me, the king of Israel. From the very first chapter of John, it's been recognized that Jesus Christ is king. That's why he said, that's why he came for this cause. I came and I come to emphasize the truth and witness unto the truth. Of course, I am king, he said. In John chapter 12, reading from verse 12. John chapter 12, 
reading from verse 12 it says on the next day much people that were come to the feast when they heard that jesus was come, was coming to jerusalem they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried hosanna blessed is who the king of israel that cometh in the name of the lord he didn't come by himself he didn't come through the roman power or through roman emperors he came by the word of the lord by the will of the heavenly father blessed is the king of israel that cometh in the name of the lord and it says uh, jesus uh, when uh, he had found a young ass at such thereon uh, as it is written fear not daughter of zion behold the king cometh sitting on an ass's colt and so we understand that jesus christ is king if he's a king he must have kingdom let's come back to john chapter 18 john chapter 18 i'm reading now from verse 37 Let's read, let us go back up to verse 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not like the kingdom of this world. What does that mean? It's not that, you know, some people will get together. Okay, let us vote. How many of you Pharisees say, vote for him as, uh, as our king? And no hand uh, went up. And it's not by voting already. It had been decided in the courts of heaven uh, from uh, the time in Memoria. We have read it in some two. It doesn't have any voting here. In the kingdom of the world, they might vote so that they can appoint a governor, an emperor, they can appoint a president or appoint a king. In the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, it had been said to I have said my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And it says this day have i begotten thee thou art my son and then you come to isaiah chapter 9 it says unto us a child is born before he was born it had been declared unto us his son is given the government shall be upon his shoulder my kingdom is not of this world it's not like they have to vote for me before i can become a king it's already king I said it's already king. Look at verse 37 now. It says in verse 37, a Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou uh, then, uh, thou the king then? Uh, Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end uh, was I born. And for this cause, for this purpose, for this reason came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. He has a kingdom. What kind of kingdom is that? Romans chapter 14 verse 17. The kingdom of Christ. And as you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and his king over you, every negative thing it will drive away from your life. Because where Jesus reigns, Satan will not reign sin will not rule when jesus reigns the powers of darkness will not reign jesus is king all by himself and in your life it will reign without a rival in jesus name but you must invite him you must invite him reign jesus reign reign jesus reign be the king of my life be the king of my heart be the king of my uh, of my existence look at the kind of kingdom he has he tells us in romans chapter 14 and i'm reading from verse 17 romans chapter 14 verse 17 it says for the kingdom of god is not meat and drink it's not like okay we're going for the passover and we're going to eat and we're going to drink we're not going to enter into pilots a judgment hall so we don't defile ourselves it is not meat and drink but it is righteousness and it is peace and it is joy in the holy ghost as you come into the kingdom of god and christ gives you his royalty and he gives you the rule over your life he'll bring number one righteousness into your life he'll take your righteousness away and then he gives you righteousness he brings peace in your heart all the restlessness he'll take away from your heart and from your life in jesus name and joy the joy of salvation and the joy and the peace of knowing god he gives unto you because the kingdom of god is righteousness is peace and is joy in the holy ghost and as you enter that kingdom victory will be yours Look at Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 12, Colossians chapter 1, 
and we're reading from verse 12 it says in verse 12 giving thanks unto the father which has made us me to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who has delivered us from the power of darkness he has delivered me from the power of darkness he has delivered me from the power of darkness this one thing i'm sure of this one i ascertain this one i can confess and this one i can proclaim he has delivered me from the power of darkness and he has translated me into the kingdom of his dear son he has delivered us will not remain in darkness will not remain under their power all their powers are broken in jesus name we cannot be under two different kings at the same time nobody can serve two masters if we are under the kingdom of christ then we are not under the kingdom of satan satan will be ashamed and sin will not have dominion over your life powers of darkness will not rule over you because it says he has delivered us from the power of darkness and he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son verse 14 in whom we have i have something there in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins look up here all those pharisees and sadducees they couldn't forgive uh, the uh, pilot and pilot couldn't forgive them there's no forgiveness in the system there in the kingdoms of this world can they give you forgiveness and give you a ticket and a title to go to heaven no way only jesus christ the king of kings and the lord of lords as you come to him he takes you away from the kingdom of darkness he establishes you in the kingdom that he is establishing an evangelical kingdom an eternal kingdom a supernatural kingdom and it gives you forgiveness it will be yours in jesus name and then he emphasizes the truth look at this in john chapter one john chapter one because he said i came to bear witness to the truth and his truth personified look at this in john chapter one john chapter one i'm reading from verse 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld this glory the glory of the only begotten as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth that truth will take effect in your life look at verse 17 for the law was given by moses but grace and truth grace and truth came by jesus christ the truth will work effectually in your life we're looking at john chapter 14 john chapter 14 we're reading from verse 6 john chapter 14 verse 6 jesus says unto him i am the way i am the truth I am the life no man cometh unto the father but by me this truth will set you free john chapter 8 john chapter 8 we're reading from verse 30 john chapter 8 verse 30 as he spake these words many believed on him somebody is believing god tonight believing on the lord jesus christ tonight then jesus said to those jews which believed on him if he continue in my word then are ye my disciples indeed verse 32 and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free free from sin free from sickness free from satan free from circumstances free from the paths of darkness know the truth the truth that jesus christ has brought ye shall know the truth and the truth will set you free you are free Amen. we're coming back to john chapter 18 point number three now the concealed mischief and willfulness of transgressors who are the transgressors these uh, chief priests and these uh, pharisees that came and they were accusing the lord Je and they were accusing the lord jesus christ and yet they were the sinners we're coming to john chapter 18 and we're looking at uh, verse 38 pilate says unto him what is truth and he went and when he had said this he went out stop there for a moment 
Jesus had just said, I came to be a witness to the truth. And Pilate said, what is truth? He didn't wait for the answer. What is truth? The truth about God. He didn't wait for the answer. The truth about the Bible, about the scriptures, he didn't wait for the answer. The truth about salvation, the truth of salvation, he didn't wait for the answer. And the truth that when your life ends over here, you're going to spend eternity somewhere. And where will you spend eternity? He didn't wait for the answer. And the truth about heaven, and the truth about eternal life, the truth about ye must be born again, he didn't wait. He just said, what is truth? And then when he had said this, he went out. There's answer here for every question. The solution here for every problem. And I pray that you'll not just go out without having the answer to the questions of your life in Jesus' name. You will not just go out and rush out without having an answer, a solution to the problem of your life. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the solution. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The way into the very presence of God, Jesus is the answer. And the solution to every problem you carry, Jesus is the answer. And when he says, I came to be a witness of the truth, and then Pilate said, what is the truth? Wait for the answer. Your answer will come. Your solution will come your miracle will come when we finish the bible study it that's not the time to rush out because that's the time now for you to have the solution to every problem you carried every problem you brought in here you'll not take them back home in jesus name but you look at look we we'll look at what he said now in verse 38 he went out again unto the jews and he said unto them i find in him no fault at all I find in him no fault at all. And let's come to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. I find in him no fault at all. Luke chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 4. Then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. If you crucify this man, you know you are doing something wrong. If you kill this man, you know you are doing something wrong. If you oppose this man, you know you you're doing something wrong if you contradict this man you are doing something wrong i find no fault in this man look at verse 14 and search on he said unto them he had brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people and behold i have examined him I examined him, I questioned him before you, and I found no fault in this man touching those things whereof he accused him. No, not yet, Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. He said, I questioned him, even Herod interrogated him, and both of us were found nothing wrong. These were people that were trained in questioning people. These were people that were trained, these governors, Roman governors, these were people that were trained in uh, interrogating people, examining people, and using all their methods, psychological and physical and everything to question criminals, and yet there's no fault in Jesus, my Savior is pure, my Savior is perfect, my Savior is holy, my Savior is the only one without blemish that can take all my sins away, he is your Savior too. Look at John, John chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 4, John chapter 19, reading from verse 4, Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, he said it already in chapter 18 of John, this is chapter 19 now, he says, behold, I bring him forth to you, that she may know that I find no fault in him. I said it before, I'm saying it again, there's no sin in this man. There's no error in this man. There's no fault in this man. Look at verse 6. When the chief priest, therefore, and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take him and crucify him yourself, for I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. How about the Jews themselves? Did the Jews actually find any fault in him? Look at John chapter 8 verse 46. John chapter 8 verse 46. Here is Jesus asking them a question. Which of you convinces me of sin? Come here and prove it. 
What sin you found in me? What sin you found on my tongue? What sin you found in my conversation? What sin you found in my interaction? What sin you find in my action? Which of you convinced me of sin? If I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? Then in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26, the life of the Lord Jesus, the heart of the Lord Jesus, the character of the Lord Jesus, the behavior of the Lord Jesus, the purity, the holiness, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. We're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens that's my jesus that's our savior that's our lord is pure and holy first peter chapter 1 verse 19 first peter chapter 1 reading from verse 19 it says but with the precious blood of christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot a lamb without blemish and without spot chapter 2 first peter chapter 2 verse 22 who did no sin that's final who did no sin in action in deed in word in character in behavior there's a perfect christ there's a spotless christ sinless christ who did no sin neither was girl found in his mouth who when he was reviled he reviled not again and when he suffered he threatened not but he committed himself to him that judges righteously in first john chapter 3 first john chapter 3 reading here from verse 5 first john chapter 3 verse 5 it says and ye know by now you know i said by now you know and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins and uh, tell me say it aloud say it if you are convinced in him is no sin why then did they say he should die we're coming back to john chapter 18 john chapter 18 and we're reading from verse 39 but she have a custom that i should release unto you one at the passover will ye therefore that i release unto you the king of the jews now pilate wanted to see if uh, they were now at least say uh, because of this passover time and because of this time of a feast and festival they'll keep to the custom they always kept to that you release somebody to them of the people that were accused but look at this matthew chapter 27 matthew chapter 27 we're looking at it from verse 18 matthew chapter 27 reading from verse 18 for he knew that for envy they had delivered him he saw them he knew them he looked at their faces he had their wars he had all the mobs and all the shouting crucify him crucify him i find no fault in him yes we find no fault too but we don't like him we don't want him crucify him get rid of him for he knew that for envy they delivered him not only that verse 19 when he was set down on the judgment seat his wife said unto him saying have thou nothing to do with that just man for i have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him you see that god revealed and god showed the wife a dream that this one your husband pilate is trying uh, is the just one is the righteous one is the holy one is the perfect one and uh, you suffer here now for just this in a dream but you are going to suffer for eternity if uh, you know this uh, goes on i pray you'll not fall into that trap we're coming to mark mark chapter 15 mark chapter 15 we're reading from verse 9 mark chapter 15 
We're reading here from verse 9. It tells us in verse 9, and still talking about Jesus Christ and about this trial that was going on, Mark chapter 15, verse 9. And Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Look at this, look at this. For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him. Why? for envy. Envy is a terrible thing. He was performing miracles and they could not do miracles. The people were running after Christ and they were forsaking their synagogues. They were forsaking their temples. And he was turning water to wine. He was giving thousands of food to eat. He was doing some things that no other prophet had ever done. No other religious leader had ever done. He was helping the people. And the people were saying is, not, is this not the prophet? Is this not the king? And when the Pharisees said that, jealousy came into them are you like that are you like that when somebody else is doing something good and is having good result and when somebody is having some upliftment and promotion and then there's jealousy in your heart i pray the spirit of the pharisees will not be in you the spirit of those who crucified christ will not be in you in jesus name it says about the chief priest in verse in verse 11 move the people that he should release barabbas unto them and then we come to romans romans chapter one envy is a terrible thing envy will not be in my heart i said envy will not be in your heart look at romans chapter one i'm reading from verse 29 romans chapter one verse 29 being filled with all unrighteousness these are not born again people where you're filled with unrighteousness you're filled with envy you're filled with jealousy you're filled with bitterness you're filled you're pregnant with evil you want to do evil by all means the blood of jesus has not cleansed you and the blood of jesus has not set you free being filled with all unrighteousness fornication wickedness covetousness maliciousness look at this what's the next thing there full of envy full of envy when a glass is full of any liquid you cannot put anything inside when the heart is full of envy they wake up in the morning and the thought coming to them they say so and so when will it come down so and so when will it be destroyed so and so when will i overpower him so and so when will he be demoted so and so when will bad things happen to it because their hearts are full of envy during the day envy and during the night envy envy will not allow them to sleep they are full of envy and what what follows is murder and debate and deceit and malignity and whisperers these are backbiters haters of god despiteful proud boasters inventors of evil things disobedient to parents without understanding covenant breakers without natural affection implacable or merciful look at this who knowing who knowing knowing what the judgment of God those whose hearts are full of envy full of jealousy full of bitterness full of hatred and full of a plot and plan to destroy other people because the other people are doing well and they are not doing well they know the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but they have pleasure in them that do them that will not be your Lord james chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 14 james chapter 3 we're reading here from verse 14 but if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts when you have envy you'll feel you'll be bitter you'll be unhappy you'll be sad you'll be sorrowful because uh, you know somebody you thought you'll not do well they're going from a to b they're going from level one to level two you think uh, they should not do well i'm better than them i should have what they're doing uh, and yet they are progressing and then bitterness will not allow you to even have a good plan for your life if you are bitter envy and strife in your hearts glory not lie not against the truth this wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthly sensual and devilish for where envy and strife is where there's envy there'll be fighting there'll be violence there'll be strife because you are struggling after something you are struggling for something i pray that you'll not be your lord 
for where envy and strife is there is confusion and every evil work the lord will cleanse us the lord will deliver us we're coming back to john chapter 18 john chapter 18 and i'm reading now from verse 40 because a pilot had asked them a question he had said who shall i release unto you shall i release unto you the king of the jews verse 40 they cried they then cried they all again saying not this man but who barabbas now barabbas was a robber look up here for a moment uh, there are many people you know when they are when they are preaching they are not teaching they don't understand the depth of the word of god and they will say you see uh, barabbas uh, was uh, you know jesus became the substitute there's another passage of scripture that tells us that and then they imply you see barabbas now barabbas was saved because jesus took his place uh-uh barabbas was barabbas released to jesus was he released to jesus was he released to the heavenly father was he released to heaven was it jesus that released barabbas who released barabbas the pharisees they were sinners sinners could not save another sinner a pharisee could not save another person jesus is the only savior and there's no record here that barbara said okay jesus since you are taking my place and they are releasing me now i appeal to you forgive me there's no prayer for forgiveness i repent i'll not be a robber anymore it was still a robber if you're going to be saved if jesus is going to take your place you must call upon jesus to forgive you he will forgive you to cleanse you he will cleanse you to save your soul it will save your soul jesus is able he's able to save tonight able to cleanse tonight able to purge and purify tonight look at hebrews look at hebrews chapter 7 hebrews chapter 7 i'm reading from verse 25 hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 it says wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost he is able to save them to the uttermost. Do you want to make that personal? He is able to save me to the uttermost. Whatever your sin, salvation has come. Whatever your guilt, salvation has come. However far you have gone, if you will call upon the Lord tonight, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved because he is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him. You must come. Come unto God for forgiveness. Come unto God for salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Sinner, he ever live to make intercession for them. You know Jesus is praying for you right now. And when at the end of the Bible story you join your prayer to the prayer of Jesus, it will work for you. In First John, First John chapter one, First John chapter one, I'm reading from verse six. If we say, if we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we say I'm a child of God, if we say I'm walking in the light, if we say I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, and then you are walking in darkness, you deceive yourself. There's no truth in you. Look at verse seven. But if we walk in the light, I see it's in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanseth us from all sin cleanseth us from all sin is that yours the blood the blood the blood of jesus christ his son cleanseth me from all sin he will do it for you Verse 9, if we confess our sins, Barabbas did not confess any sin. Barabbas did not call upon the Lord for salvation. Barabbas did not call upon the Lord for mercy. But if we call upon him, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Tonight he will do it look at it now in john first john chapter 3 first john chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 5 it says in verse 5 and ye know that he was manifested to take away 
our sins and in him is no sin it's come to take away the guilt of your sin it's come to take away the pollution defilement of your sin it's come to take away the punishment of your sin in him is no sin whosoever abideth in him sinneth not whosoever sinneth has not seen him neither known him little children let no man deceive you he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous he that committed sin what's that is of the devil he that committed sin in secret is of the devil he that committed sin in the public is of the devil he that committed sin in the office is of the devil he that commits committed sin anywhere anytime is of the devil for the devil sinned from the beginning for this purpose the son of god was manifested that he might that he might destroy the works of the devil the time has come it will destroy all the work of the devil in your life in Jesus name whosoever is born of God does not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God looks like that's going to happen to you tonight it will keep you from sinning Jude reading from verse 24 Jude Verse 24, now unto him that is able, our Savior is able, our Lord is able, our King is able, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen. He'll do it for you tonight. Amen. I said he'll do it for you tonight. You will not do like Pilate. He asked the question, what is truth? The truth of salvation. What is truth? The truth of holiness. What is truth? The truth of heaven. What is truth? The truth of the kingdom. And then Amen said that. He didn't wait for an answer. He didn't wait for the solution. Then he ran out. You are going to wait for your answer. You are going to wait for your solution. The truth of salvation is not presented to you. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He'll cleanse you. He'll wash you. He'll put you. And he'll write your name in the book of life. And after saving you, he will keep you from falling. Let's rise up. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord, here is my chance. Here is my opportunity. I must have this privilege today. Don't be like uh, all those uh, people. They were traditional, but they were not. Uh, they were not righteous. They were religious. They were not uh, righteous in the sight of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Came and His mission is so that the truth that He brought, the truth of salvation, will be established and spread all over the earth. And is coming to you today. Call upon the Lord and let it be yours tonight. <laughs>